Good morning. Good morning. I'm Kurt Ullman. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Savannah, working to build a diverse, multicultural, and beloved community. We celebrate the presence and participation of people of all races, genders, sexual orientations, abilities, and ethnic and national origins. We welcome you on YouTube and on site. There is a place for you here, whomever you may be. I'm very excited to serve as worship associate on this first Sunday with Reverend Lisa Day as our called minister. If you're visiting with us and would like to introduce yourself, please rise or raise your hand and Raven will bring a microphone. Is there anyone visiting on this side who'd like to introduce themselves? There is a person. My name's Mary Garofalo. I moved to Savannah back in June, um, and I heard things about the church, very <laughs> nice things. So <laughs> I thought I would come and, uh, and see for myself and you know get involved and uh, be part of a, a, a nice community. And, um, and I think that's about it. Thank you. Welcome, welcome. Anyone else on this side? How about this side? Okay. Well, we welcome everybody. It's good to have you all with us. Please join us in the social hall for a special reception for Reverend Lisa after the service. You'll find the social hall in the next building by following the crowd through this door or the main doors or ask the ushers. Two cards in the uh, pew back in front of you help us gather information for the good of our community. Use the rainbow chalice card, either the QR code or the space provided, to write your contact in information to sign up for our newsletter and to receive a welcome letter from our minister. And this is a good time to use the card with the red heart and chalice to share a joy or sorrow. If you fill out either of these cards, please uh, put it in the collection plate a little later this morning. Church announcements are emailed to members and friends on Tuesdays and Friday. Z. Check your email for complete details. With the lighting of our chalice, symbol of our Unitarian Universalist faith, we enter into sacred time. Our chalice lighter this morning is Caitlin. And our <laughs> symbol of light and knowledge, symbol of warmth and freedom. We light this chalice as a symbol of our faith. Here we gather to celebrate hope and the infinite possibilities of love. Welcome to this place where certainty transforms to questions. This place that takes what is and imagines what can be. Welcome to this space where what was fixed begins to shift, where rigidity embraces unfolding as we join in the dance of transformation. Welcome to this moment of change where together we transfigure and transcend together. Will you please rise now in body or in spirit for our hymn number 1000 in the teal supplement, Morning Has Come.
We have a guest reading our story this morning. Please welcome Miss Harvey. Miss Harvey is a former student of our president, Jane Rago. Hi, everyone. How are y'all? Uh, I'm so happy to be here with y'all and to share this moment with y'all. Um, do y'all like to read? Yes. OK, I do too. Uh, just a bit? OK, I get that. I feel that. <laughs> um, well, today, we're going to be reading Magic by Morel Ortega. It's a very, very beautiful book with this beautiful little, and this isn't like the start of the book, but I just love this picture. <laughs> um, so let's get started. Let me tell you about the place where I'm from, a faraway land brimming with magic, powerful magic that twists and turns around, tw touches everything around you. The pretty birds. It's a place where rain kisses the earth and wild things flourish and people turn wilderness into harvest. Look at the little pineapples. She lives on a pineapple farm. That's, that's what the book's about, just so y'all know. Um. We can still look at the picture. <laughs> and my abuela taught me to string words together to make up stories, where my mama and tia wove single threads of wool into the most beautifully intricate blankets. Let's look at that blanket. And my papa transformed sketches into, <laughs> into stone buildings, bricks into siloed walls. In my faraway land, I sow tiny seeds that grow in the shady trees, where beneath it I sat and played on the hot summer days. I also saw little bugs. I also saw little bugs become um, plagues, and pleasant rains turned into tropical storms, and my favorite trees turned into lonely stumps. I learned that magic isn't good or bad, it just is. Sometimes it gives, sometimes it takes. Sometimes it blossoms, sometimes it wilts. And sometimes it is confusing. The way magic can change things for better and for worse. <laughs> but even in the darkest moments, the spark of magic shines through. Life changes in the ofrendas every day of the dead. My abuela used to say, there is no harvest without rain, and there is no sadness that magic can't turn to happiness again, even though sometimes it doesn't feel like it. Sometimes magic takes its time, but it always is there, like when people's hands touch the earth and plant seeds that become fruit. Like when simple ingredients turn into delicious meals, 
like when strangers turn into friends and houses into homes. Like when sounds are woven together into most beautiful music, like when the harachos dance. Magic is everywhere. You can feel it in the air, even in a new, faraway land. Let me see if I can turn this page. Thank you. <laughs> and you can feel it in your fingertips, like when blank pages become pictures. And that's the end. Thank you for being such good listeners. Thanks. We'll sing you on your way to religious education. Can you say thank you? are from Victoria Weinstein. We say in our church that the offering is a sacrament of the free church. What we mean by that is that we believe it is a blessing to be able to govern and support our religious community ourselves, to make possible by our generosity everything we dream of and do to live out our shared values. Every week we lift up the spiritual value of generosity by taking an offering for the ministries of this church. Our plate then, as it is passed among us, becomes filled with the evidence of that generosity. It is our harvest, gathered in every week for what most nourishes us. The ushers will now come among you to receive the gifts of the congregation. The morning offering will be most gratefully received. To donate via debit or credit card, please use the QR code on the back of the order of service, or go to www.uusavannah.org and click the donate button. Mail checks are also welcome. Thank you for your generosity.
We have several joys and sorrows to share today from Diane Hutter, a concern, prayers of comfort for the family and friends of my dear friend Nancy on her sudden death. She was truly a gift from God. And from Joseph Chapel, a joy. I'm glad I can see two different UU churches with their own charms. And I have a sorrow. Our, we had to say goodbye to our 15-year-old dog on Monday, and it's been kind of a sad week. For all the joys and sorrows we hold, spoken and unspoken, let us join together in the responsive reading found in your order of service. Sorrow is everywhere. As we mourn together, so we celebrate together, and offer thanks, we are not alone. so may it be now and in all the days to come. Let us continue in a spirit of meditation. The words of meditation this morning from the Reverend Lynn Cox. Creative spirit, source of life and love, we give thanks for the beauty of this day and for the company of those assembled here. Thank you for the breezes of change, clearing our heads and bringing fresh ideas. May they cleanse our minds of the oppressions and other isms that divide us. Thank you for the flame of hope, the heat of righteous anger, the warmth of compassion and the fire of commitment. May they bubble the cauldrons of transformation. Thank you for oceans of love, rivers of connection, tears of relief, and pools of serenity. May healing waters flow over us and through us and among us, wearing down the sharp rocks of despair to bring joy in the morning. Thank you for the good earth beneath us, around us, and within us. May we take this clay and co-create a new realm of justice and beauty. Thank you for all these and more. We accept our gifts and commit to building, sculpting, painting, singing, and dancing them to life, to abundant life. Amen.
Our first reading this morning, get to it as soon as Kurt gets the microphone, I forgot. <laughs> A poem for two voices by Paul Fleshman, Chrysalis Diary. November 13th. Cold told me to fasten my feet to this branch. To dangle upside down from my perch. To shed my skin. To cease being a caterpillar. And, and I, I have, have obeyed. obeyed. December 6th. Green. The color of leaves and life has vanished. vanished. The empire of leaves lies, lies in ruins. ruins. I study the brown new world around me. I fear the future. I hear few sounds. Have any others of my kind survived this cataclysm? Swinging back and forth in the wind, I feel immeasurably alone. January 4th. I can make out snow falling. For five days and nights, it's been drifting down. I find I never tire of watching the flakes in their multitudes passing my windows. The world is now white. Astounding. Astounding. I enter these wondrous events in my chronicle. Knowing no reader would believe me. February 12th. An ice storm last night. Unable to see out at all this morning. Yet I hear boughs cracking and branches falling. Hungry for sounds in this silent world, I cherish these. Ponder their import. Miser them away in my memory and, and wait, wait for, for more. more. March 28th. I wonder whether I am the same being who started this diary. I've felt stormy inside. Like the weather without. My mouth is reshaping. My legs are dissolving. Wings are growing. My, My body's, body's not, not mine. mine. This morning, a breeze from the south, strangely fragrant. A red-winged blackbird's call in the distance. A faint glimpse of green in the branches. And now I recall that last night I dreamt of flying. I love those poems for two voices, but they're only about insects. <laughs> <laughs> At least the ones I've found so far, so we don't have very many opportunities to use them, but thank you. <laughs> Our second reading by Karen Boy is translated from the Swedish by Nadine Bjursten. Of course, it hurts when the buds burst. Why otherwise would they hesitate? Why would all our fiery longing be bound by that frozen, bitter pallor? The bud was a casing all winter. What is this new thing that consumes and ruptures? Of course it hurts when the buds burst, hurts for that which grows and that which ceases. Truly it's hard when the drops fall. Trembling with fear, they hang heavily, clinging to the twig, swelling, slipping. The weight pulls them down, how they hold on. It is hard to be uncertain, afraid and torn. Hard to feel the deep pulling and calling, yet to remain in place, trembling. Hard to want to stay, and want to fall. Then, when it can't get worse and nothing helps, the tree's buds burst as if in jubilation. Then, when the fear no longer holds, the drops of the twig plunge in splendor, forgetting they were afraid of the new, forgetting they were anxious about the journey, feeling that for this second their greatest confidence resting in the trust that creates the world. And finally, from Gabrielle Calva Corisi, at last the new arriving. 
Like the horn you played in Catholic school, the city will open its mouth and cry out. Don't worry about nothing. Don't mean no thing. It will leave you stunned as a fighter with his eyes swelled shut who's told he won the whole darn purse. It will feel better than any floor that's risen up to meet you. It will rise like Easter bread, golden and familiar in your grandmother's hands. She'll come back, heaven having been too far from home to hold her. Oh, it will be beautiful. Every girl will ask you to dance and the boys won't kill you for it. Shake your head, dance until your bones clatter. What a prize you are. What a lucky sack of stars. Here end the readings. Will you rise in body or spirit for hymn number 128 in the gray hymnal for all that is our life. that hymn too, but David didn't know it, but I said it's on Margaret Hall's list of hymns the congregation knows, and he said, all right then. <laughs> I saw a made-for-TV movie once that told the story of two women who had catastrophic medical events. A stereotypical suburban Ordinary wife and mother had a massive aneurysm. Meanwhile, crossing the road in front of the same hospital where the first woman was pronounced brain dead, the second woman, a stereotypically graceful and beautiful model, was hit by a truck. Her body irreparably mangled, her spinal column probably severed. Can you guess what's coming? Surgeons decided, with the permission of the second woman and the husband of the first woman, to attempt a radical experimental procedure. They transplanted the brain, the unharmed brain of the model, into the unharmed body of the wife and mother. Drama ensued, and I stopped watching. <laughs> rather, rather than absorb the anxiety of the emotional strife resulting from that improbable transformation. 
A hospital chaplain told me about one of her patients awaiting a real life, but perhaps still far removed from our personal experience, most of us anyway, transformation in the form of a life-saving heart transplant. That born-again Christian patient was both eager and full of fears. One of those fears was that Jesus Christ would not be in their new heart the way he was in their original heart. Advertisers, marketers, influencers, and most users and consumers of social media would have us believe that real life transformation short of the transplant of an organ that may or may not contain the seeds of our essential being and existing relationships, these people and industries would have us believe that real life transformations are quick, simple, and hassle-free. Everything from a morning cup of coffee to powered drinks and supplement-laden smoothies, from shoe sole inserts to exercise programs, from a fresh coat of paint on the bedroom walls to a meditation practice are promised to transform outlooks, health, and whole lives in a matter of hours, days, or a week or two at the most. The gym at the end of my street is even called Transform Savannah. From before our birth until the moment of our death, our human lives are marked by transformation. And many of those transformations are dramatic, though not as sensational as the two I described a moment ago. But they don't happen overnight, and they aren't as simple as downing the right quasi-healthful elixir. If we were to pass a microphone through the pews right now, I bet each of you could tell us of a transformation you or someone close to you is undergoing this very day from addiction to recovery, from single to partnered, working to retired, actively raising children to empty nester, from isolation to connection, from robust health to disability or chronic disease, <clears throat> from doubting to knowing, from knowing to wondering, from existing as the gender assigned at birth to living one's true gender, from a child of parents to caregiver of parents, on and on. I'm not overly interested in defining or debating change versus transition versus transformation. When the moment comes, each of us knows in our heart whether we have changed or transformed, and our knowing about our own life is all that matters. When a moth or a butterfly emerges from a cocoon, there is little or no resemblance, structurally and visibly, between the before and after. We don't know, that is to say, I don't know, maybe somebody does, if in their brains, moths and butterflies feel the same or different than they did before their transformation. But from the outside, they are completely different creatures. What once was dissolves inside the cocoon and reconstitutes into a winged being we recognize as moth or butterfly. For us as human beings, transformation is more complicated even if we don't dissolve and reconstitute as a completely different creature. <clears throat> Sometimes when we undergo a transformation, we feel in our hearts and minds like a brand new person. But to others, nothing about us seems to have changed. Other times when we transform from merely existing or barely surviving as the gender we are assigned at birth into living as the gender we truly and elementally are, for example, sometimes we look to others like a whole new, brand new person, but feel like the person we have always been, only liberated. At either of these two ends of the transformation spectrum and all along it, it takes someone who knows us very well, 
someone who pays close and careful attention to notice the full extent of our transformation. In the first case, to notice that our shift from one state of being to another, from addiction to sobriety, for example, has had a profound impact on our worldview, our ability to inhabit previously accustomed spaces and roles, our sense of who we are in relation to family members and friends, and most importantly, our sense of who we are, full stop. And in the second instant, to see our eternal, essential self shining through and beyond the physical changes of gender affirmation and clothing choices and name and pronoun choices that may distract and mislead less careful, less loving, less respectful observers. Life in relationship, and we're all in relationship all of our lives, calls us to be careful, loving, respectful, and sometimes brave observers of transformation in those around us. Further, life in relationship calls us to be guided in our behavior and interactions by those transformations we observed or are informed of in those with whom we are in relationship. Family members, friends, church members, colleagues, students, and neighbors. We don't press alcohol on someone whose life has been transformed by recovery. We don't use dead names or incorrect pronouns of someone whose life has been transformed by gender affirmation. We do celebrate with someone who tells us that their transformation into parenthood or out of marriage, from civilian life into military service or vice versa, or any other transformation, when they tell us it is joyful and a cause for celebration. Even if we don't see cause for celebration or understand the joy, if someone we love undergoes a transformation that brings them joy, we are called to be the city that opens, it mouth, opens its mouth and cries, what a prize you are. What a lucky sack of stars. And if we are the one who has transformed, ah, well, then it should be us crying what a prize you are, what a lucky sack of stars, right? But it's not always automatic, is it? The joy or even the neutral acceptance of transformation. I said I wasn't going to differentiate between change and transition or transformation, but maybe, after all, what distinguishes transformation from the other two is scale. Personal transformation can, perhaps, make us almost unrecognizable even to ourselves. Are we still ourselves sober or without our late spouse or the partner we've separated from? After spending all of our adult life up to this moment in the military, who are we as a civilian? Is the professional, the wilderness adventurer, global traveler, life of the party, somewhere within the parent we have become, or have they disappeared forever? Transformation sort of sounds as though it is something that happens with a kiss or the wave of a wand or chanted incantation. Then a cloud of colored smoke and a handsome print stands where the frog or hideous beast once stood, or a magnificent carriage in place of a pumpkin. Then all is right with the world. Instant transformation, instant acceptance of how one has been transformed. That's the way it is in fairy tales as they have been softened and prettied up for children. But our story this morning reminded us that though it is always there, sometimes magic, another word for transformation, sometimes it takes its time. And in a poem that would have been one too many readings to read in its entirety this morning, May Sarton wrote, now I become myself. It's taken time, many years and places, 
I have, dissol I have been dissolved and shaken, worn other people's faces. Often, that's the way our real life, human transformations happen. Slowly, over years, sometimes with the wearing of other faces for a time, or speaking with other voices, metaphorically, until one day it is all so obvious, this is who I am. Now I am myself. Because, speaking of fairy tales, remember in Shrek, true love's kiss transformed Fiona not from ogre by night and princess by day into princess day and night, but rather into ogre day and night, for that was her true nature. I said last week that we come to church to reckon with living in the uncertainty of now and into the uncertainty of the future. In a world that is telling us all the time, in a million different ways, who we should be or who we would be better off becoming, one of the greatest uncertainties is, am I truly who I am meant to be? As Fiona discovered, transformation isn't always, in fact, very seldom is, something we can predict, much less direct. Rather, in the end, it springs from resting in the trust that creates the world. Only then can we remember that last night we dreamt of flying. Only then can the fear of change, the grief of loss, the anxiety of uncertainty give way to the joy of becoming less who we are meant to be and more who we truly always were if we had but trusted ourselves. Many of our Soul Matters themes this church year, including this month's gift of transformation, come from the values set forth in the proposed revisions to Article 2 of the Unitarian Universalist Association bylaws. We value transformation of so many kinds, healing the world, creating art, and loving people into the fullness of their being. Here in our Unitarian Universalist Church home, may we engage wholeheartedly in the pursuit and midwifery of transformation wherever and whenever and however it waits for us to notice it, but most especially the transformation of one another into a whole new person and not a whole new person all at the same time, over and over and over again. Amen. Will you please rise in body or spirit for our hymn of the month, number 368, Now Let Us Sing. We'll sing just the top line, all the way through.
dance until your bones clatter. For what a prize you are, what a lucky sack of stars. Amen. <laughs>